Islam has been part of the American religious fabric since the first colonial settlers arrived in North America, and African Muslims were an integral part of creating the United States, from mapping its borders to fighting against British rule. While we do not know exactly how many African Muslims were enslaved and forcibly transported to the Western Atlantic world, scholars believe that roughly 10 to 15 percent of all enslaved Africans were Muslim, and a much larger number would have been familiar with the religious and cultural practices of Islam due to the religion's spread throughout Western Africa. Despite the fact that there are no concrete records of the number of Muslims, there are remnants of their presence in historical records dating back to the 16th century, and we can also see them in existing cultural and religious traditions today. Although enslaved Africans were not brought to the modern United States for sale until the early 1600s, they were present on American shores around a century earlier. Spanish colonialists brought enslaved Africans, including enslaved African Muslims, with them to Florida and the southern coast as early as 1513. One of these men, Mustafa Azamuri, called Estevanico, was sold by the Portuguese into slavery in 1522. While enslaved by Spanish conquistador Andres Dorantes de Carranza, Estevanico became one of the first Africans to set foot on the North American continent. He explored Florida and the Gulf Coast, eventually traveling as far west as modern New Mexico. In addition to exploration, enslaved African Muslims also helped militarily expand British American colonial frontiers. During the French and Indian War, which pitted British America against New France, British Major General Edward Braddock was defeated at Fort Duquesne in 1755. The British retreated east and built a line of forts in modern Huntington County, Pennsylvania. One, called Fort Shirley, was quickly abandoned, but not before a blacksmith could forge a small, circular charm featuring the phrase, No God but Allah, in Arabic. This shows the presence of at least one Muslim man in the British military during the colonial period, and hints at a larger community. African Muslims also fought on both sides of the Revolutionary War. Multiple men with Muslim names appear on the military muster rolls, including the Patriots, Baphat Muhammad, Yusuf ben Ali, also known as Joseph ben Haley, and Joseph Saba. Other men listed on muster rolls have names that are likely connected to Islamic practice, such as Salem Poor and Peter Salem, whose names may reflect a form of the Arabic salam, meaning peace. These men often distinguish themselves on the battlefield. They also attained high-ranking positions, such as Civil War Union Captain Moses Osman, who was the highest-ranking known Muslim in that conflict. Despite significant obstacles, enslaved Muslims used their faith to build communities, resist their enslavement, and pursue their freedom. They left numerous written accounts of their experiences in America in the form of letters, diaries, and autobiographies, most of them in Arabic. Omar ibn Said penned an autobiography in 1831, the only known autobiography of an enslaved person in a native African language. They also wrote pages of Arabic for their enslavers and other members of white society, like the American Colonization Society. But instead of writing what the recipients believed was a Bible verse or the Lord's Prayer, they wrote Quranic verses, made genealogical lists, and even pleaded to return home to Africa. They also blended Islam and Christianity. For example, they combined the Basmala and Lord's Prayer in documents, and they inscribed Islam into Christian spaces, such as etching Surah An-Nas into a pew at the First African Church of Savannah. This final chapter of the Quran is meant as a protection, in this case symbolically used against their enslavers. Enslaved Muslims also created objects to practice their faith. In the 1730s, Ayuba Suleiman Diallo wrote multiple copies of the Quran from memory for use in devotion and education. And the WPA Narratives, a series of interviews conducted in the 1930s and 40s with formerly enslaved persons and their descendants, are filled with references to other important objects of religious practice, namely beads called tasbe and prayer mats. As Katie Brown, the great-granddaughter of Bilali Muhammad, who was enslaved on Sapello Island, Georgia, recalls, Quote, Bilali and his wife Phoebe pray on the bead. They bow to the sun and have a little mat to kneel on. The bead is on a long string. Bilali he pull bead and he say, Bilambi hakabara Muhammadu. Phoebe she say, Amin, Amin. End quote. 
However, enslaved African Muslims also experienced open hostility and hardship when practicing their faith. Ayuba Suleiman Diallo was pelted with dirt by a white boy in Kent Island, Maryland, as he prayed. Others were forced to wear sacrilegious clothing, abandon dietary rules and religious fasting, or abstain from the required daily prayers. An unnamed Moorish slave in Louisiana confirmed this hardship in 1822 when he, quote, lamented that his situation as a slave in America prevents him from obeying the dictates of his religion, unquote. Nevertheless, they persevered and lived their faith. Some became pseudo-converts to Christianity in order to protect themselves and their families or secure their freedom. Lamin Kebi pretended to convert to Christianity to secure passage back to Africa through the American Colonization Society in 1834. However, after returning to Africa, Kebi disappeared into Sierra Leone, surely, quote, still retaining his Mohammedan creed, end quote. The Islam initially brought to America by enslaved Africans did not survive many generations but it left traces in traditions that are still visible today. The practice of ring shout, a form of religious dance in which men and women rotate counterclockwise while singing, clapping their hands, and shuffling their feet, may have been inherited from enslaved Muslims such as Bilali Muhammad and Saliya Bilali in the Georgia Sea Islands. The movement mimics the ritual circling of the Kaaba in Mecca by Muslim pilgrims called Tawaf, and the name shout may come from the Arabic shout, meaning a single run. The WPA narratives also contain reminiscences of rice cakes called saraka, which were handed out during rituals and feast days. From the Arabic word sadaka, or free will offering, this charity is an aspect of zakat, one of the pillars of Islam. And early blues singers, like those recorded by ethnomusicologist Alan Lomax in Levy Camp Holler, employed singing styles reminiscent of the adhan, or call to prayer. They use sweeping and extended vocalizations to fill the words with intense emotions. Enslaved Muslims were brought to the United States with distinct cultural and religious beliefs, caught in the middle of complicated social and legal attitudes from the very moment they landed on America's Atlantic shores. They succeeded in forming networks and communities, and they maintained their religious identity despite overwhelming odds. The material culture enslaved Muslims left behind, books, writings, clothing, beads, and rugs, and the traditions they cultivated help tell their stories today. Islam has always been an important religion in America. It's essential to develop a national conversation that fosters and augments our collective memory of these men, women, and children. One that honors how the call to prayer has been sounding from sea to shining sea for more than 500 years. <laughs> I'm Ayla Amen for the Amir Stein Center. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you don't miss any new videos.